What's up everyone and welcome to another episode on the corner. Today we are continuing our series about the moon. In our previous video we talked about the infamous Apollo 11 mission and the major lunar discoveries that were made during the historic flight. But now we're going to focus on the second of the six crewed missions that landed there. Apollo 12 launched from the Kennedy Space Center on November 14th, 1969, and five days later on November 19th would become the second crewed landing on the moon. Astronauts Pete Conrad and Al Bean landed in a place called Oceanus Procellarum, which is Latin for Ocean of Storms. Oceanus Procellarum is the largest maria on the moon. Apollo 11's mission was mostly just about the landing. Their goal was to simply just get Eagle safely on the surface. It did not matter if they landed where they were supposed to, or if they landed 5 kilometers downrange, which is exactly what happened. However, Apollo 12 had a target, the Surveyor 3 landing site. In 1967, NASA landed Surveyor 3 on the lunar surface. It was the first lander to send pictures from the surface back to Earth. One of Apollo 12's most important objectives was to retrieve the data from Surveyor 3. Not only would Conrad land their lunar module Intrepid safely on the moon, he would land only 160 meters away, a remarkable accomplishment. Unlike Apollo 11's solo EVA, Apollo 12 would have two. During the first EVA, Conrad and Bean deployed the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, or ALSAP. The notable ALSAP instruments were a solar wind collector, a magnetometer, and a seismometer. The magnetometer was used to measure the strength of the moon's magnetic field. Apollo 12's magnetometer would record a very, very weak field strength at Oceanus Procellarum, showing that the moon's magnetic field is thousands of times weaker than the Earth's. Nonetheless, the magnetometer, data, and readings of magnetism within lunar samples would lead scientists to conclude that during the moon's infancy of its evolution, its core, which must have had substantial amounts of iron, likely would have been undergoing convection, and its magnetic field would have been much stronger. The seismometer also provided some very important data. In the 1930s, Inge Lamond would make a groundbreaking discovery. While recording the arrival times of seismic waves from different stations around the world, she noticed something very strange. Here's the situation. We have five seismic stations. Station 1 is the first to receive the seismic waves. Station 2 is the second. Station 3 is the third. So you probably expect Station 4 to receive the signal next, right? But instead, Station 5 picks it up. How is this possible? Seismic waves are no different than any other wave, and scientists learn that waves can travel at different speeds through different mediums. Take the speed of sound. The speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second, but in water, it's 1,480. So let's look at our hypothetical situation again. There is something a little wrong here. Ah, there we go. Sorry, flat earthers. So recap, one is first, two is second, three is third, but five is fourth. If we assume that everything here in the Earth is the same medium, this is impossible. But what if there was another medium, like near the center of the Earth? Look how the waves here travel much faster, taking a much shorter time to reach Station 5 instead of Station 4. This is exactly what Inge Lamond discovered. And not only did she discover that the Earth had different layers, she also was able to figure out the composition and diameter based on the speed and arrival times of each layer. Scientists would use the Apollo 12 seismometer on the moon for this exact same purpose. The impact of Intrepid on the lunar surface after it was jettisoned by the crew was used as a baseline for the interior lunar measurements. This helped produce a 150 kilometer depth profile beneath Oceanus Procellarum. The first layer from 0 to 25 kilometers is composed of basalts, with traces of breccia. The second layer from 25 to 60 kilometers is composed of gabbro, with traces of anorthosite. This discovery provided the confirmation for the hypothesis on how Maria formed. Maria did indeed solidify from the recrystallization of a subsurface gabbro layer into basalt after it became exposed due to an asteroid impact removing the anorthosite highland layer. Finally, the third layer from 60 to 150 kilometers is composed of pyroxenite, an igneous rock with very high abundances of iron and magnesium. Scientists concluded the change in composition from the North Acidic Gabbro to Pyroxenite is the actual boundary between the lunar crust and mantle. The second EVA resulted in the collection of 34 kilograms of lunar samples, 45 rocks and the rest being reg lunar regolith. 
While Apollo 11 collected a nearly equal mixture of Mario basalts and impact breccias at Maritron Quilatopsis, Apollo 12 samples were pretty much all basalts, with a couple impact breccia. Apollo 11's basalts were dated to have formed about 3.6 to 3.9 billion years ago, but the Mario basalts at Oceanus Procellarum formed about 3.1 to 3.3 billion years ago, roughly 500 million years after Maritron Quilatopsis. Furthermore, the basalts at Oceanus Procellarum had much less titanium. The difference in ages and chemical composition between the two sites added further confirmation that Maria crystallization did not occur as a single mood wine event, but instead individually. Additionally, the Apollo 12 landing site had a ray of material ejected from the Copernicus crater. Dating of the lunar regolith from the Copernicus crater showed that its impact occurred only 800 million years ago. This allowed scientists to finally start adding information to the lunar timescale developed in the early 1960s. So we can now add the ages of the Copernican era, the present to 800 million years ago. Finally, a breccia rock was found at Oceanus Procellarum that had components of CREEP. CREEP is an acronym for rocks that are rich in the elements potassium, atomic symbol K, rare earth elements like zirconium, and phosphorus. The rare earth elements in creeks have higher melting points than the elements in a typical basalt or anorthosite, meaning that those elements will crystallize first. So when the zircon in Apollo 12 sample 12013 was radiometric dated, it came as no surprise that it was the oldest sample to date, at 4 billion years old. This suggested that the once moon-wide magma ocean potentially cooled about 4 billion years ago, which also meant that all Maria should be less than 4 billion years old. Now, looking at our lunar time scale, we can add the boundary age between the pre-imbrium and imbrium periods. Even though we had not landed at Mare Imbrium, scientists boldly predicted that it should not be older than 4 billion years old. The following Apollo landings would help provide further insight on the evolution of the moon itself from Genesis to today.